<laughs> no, but I, 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 it seems I can I can understand what you say perfectly. So um, hopefully that, there won't be fantastic. Any I will speak clearly because I know I'm Scottish. Okay. But it's really difficult, so <laughs> I will uh, I'll speak clearly. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello and welcome to Under the Maples Lights, and this is our final season. And today's guest we have Francesco, and I hope I pronounced this right, Nepitello who is the co-designer of War of the Rings, the board game, alongside Roberto De Miglo, who we've had in the show previously. And there was one other designer that was involved in that, which I cannot remember the top of my head, but I'm sure Francesco will let you know about that. Uh, let me just briefly explain, quickly, before we introduce our guest and what the show is all about, we'll be drawing out 10 random questions for our guests. Our guest has no idea what the questions are. And we've changed them from season to season, and our last season is completely different. So there are standard usual questions, most of which are related to the board game industry. We have three different categories of questions. One are yes, no questions, which features a very simple answer. And we have what, what's the first thing it comes to mind questions. And we have agree and disagree questions. This will be interesting. And with the yes or no questions, we'll be asking our guests just to come up with an answer straight away, whether it's yes or no, especially with the first thing that comes to mind. So we'll get a quick answer um, and what the thought process is with that particular phrase. So this will be exciting and completely different to our last two Under the Maple Light shows. So I'll hand you over to Francesco to explain a little bit about himself and his designs that he has created. So Francesco, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. It seems that it's going to be exciting. It almost sounds like a psychological evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, my name is Francesco Nepitello. I'm a game designer from Italy, uh, specifically from Venice. And I started, I think, about yeah, 30 years ago now. My first game was published in 1993. It was a role-playing game called Alex Arcana. And I think I'm known for a couple of things, in particular for the World of the Ring line of games that I designed together with Roberto Di Meglio that you mentioned previously, and Marco Maggi, that is my longtime co-designer. We were schoolmates. <laughs> and we still share a studio now in Venice since a long time now. And my other main occupation as a game designer is um, designing role-playing games. Uh, it was my first passion, and, and we went back to, to them uh, in uh, 2007 when we designed the One Ring, that it's the, the role-playing game based on the Lord of the Rings, and now it's in its second edition. So I'm... Yeah, with Marco especially, and now with the team from Simon, because I'm working with Cool Mini or Not as a game designer, uh, we divide our time between designing big thematic board games and uh, role-playing games. And by the way, uh, in this moment, our uh, latest uh, creation, the Dune War for Arrakis board game, is arriving to backers as we speak. Uh, and by the time this recording is, is 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 out there, they would have received the game hopefully by by then. Um, and I'm sure that game can still be picked up by the time this recording is is released. So I'm sure it'll be widely available. Um, right. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for that insight. And for those who have not actually seen uh, Under the Meeple Lecture with Roberto De Miglo, please, he was in season one, please do check it out. There's some really interesting questions. And he'll be hopefully be popping on in our final season as well. So, with introductions out of the way, let's get started and jump straight in to our first question. So, bear in mind, I'll let you know whether it's a yes or no question, agree or disagree question, and what the first phrase that comes to mind type of question. Okay, so let's draw them out and start with our first one from Cheska and let's see what we've got so our first question once I open this up okay so it's a what phrase comes to mind type of question so when a board game you purchase comes with miniatures where you have to glue every limb i.e. every little piece what's the first phrase that comes to mind Dan <laughs> <laughs> I mean it, it, it let me elaborate just a little bit. I just had this experience because I bought a game where uh, some of the miniatures were composed of seven different pieces. And I came back to my recollections when I was uh, a, a tank and plane pit uh, fan and I was building uh, Second World War stuff way, way long ago. 
So yeah, frustrating. So <laughs> it's frustrating, man. It, it is. I remember I got a game. It was Terminator, and uh, it, it can be miniatures, but they were stuck in this very old school. As you you generally pick up in a magazine, you get these little pieces in a square, and they're all kind of put in. You had to yes. take them off. You had to glue all the limbs. I thought I'm not doing that. So I got rid of the game. I thought there's no way I'm spending hours doing that, um, and that's taught me a lesson. I'll never buy a game again unless it's actually <laughs> as as a whole. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what other people think about that as well, because I just haven't got the patience to be doing that all the time. So convenience is the key for me. So let's dive in to our second question. So let's see, we've got a different type of question. Now, these are all randomly mixed in. So we've got an agree and disagree question here. So this would be interesting. So sleeving cards is pointless because I'd rather spend my money on more games and enhances my tactile experience. Do you agree with that phrase or do you disagree? I completely agree. <laughs> Le why? Why? I don't, I don't sleep cards. I, I, I mean, I prefer to... I mean, if I play a game so much that I'm going to wear down the cards, I'd rather buy the game again because I love it so much rather than sleeve the cards. Uh, also because you sleeve, all, if you end up sleeving the cards, you do that for all your games, even the ones that maybe you are not going to play again. So it's a waste of time if you sleeve the cards for a game you won't play. So my opinion is, you know, if you play a game 10 times, it's a, it's a huge hit because uh, it means it's a really good game. And I think it... it it is worth to buy it again, the cards eventually, if they if they are worn down. They won't wear down after 10 games. So really, I find it pointless. <laughs> it is a good point. And I think people have, have a bit of OCDS obsession about keeping it in real pristine condition. Now, I can understand that for games that aren't out in the market, perhaps as a second hand have picked up because it's not been leased again. I can understand that, I completely get that. And I sleeved a lot of games and I miss that tactile feel of it, especially, especially with the high quality cards. And they're a lot easier to shuffle without sleeves. They're annoying with sleeves. And you're absolutely right. Usually, once you play the game, you know, you know, five to ten times, the cards don't generally wear unless you're, no. you're really rough with them. The only exception is cards with black borders. They get chipped quite easily because, because of the, the, it's a dark colour. And that's natural. So I can understand people sleeving those types of cards. But I, I once got the habit of sleeving all cards. And at one, it's costly and yes. it's time consuming. I've got to the point where I can't be bothered anymore. And what is the point? Unless perhaps you've got children who are touching the cards that might get them a little bit dirty. I can understand that by sleeving to protect them. But to do it for every single game, with exception, perhaps deck building games, we are constantly shoveling cards. I might understand that, but yes. that feel goes away. And personally, I actually prefer it without sleeves because I just love the feel of it. And you're absolutely right. Some games, I can use Dominion as an example, it's such a cheap game to get. Now, you could play that game 30 times. The cards are still be in good condition. So you'd have to play it in excess of 50 times before you might even have to consider getting another yeah. copy. Yeah, it actually never happened to me to buy again a game because I destroyed the cards that I wore down the card. I wear down the cards so much that it, they need replacing. So, I, yeah, I, I see your points anyway because some of the games uh, I actually leave them because of uh, the reasons you you mentioned. Like they need to be shuffled a lot. In that case, of course, leap cards are are convenient. But I recently got a, a, a very nice present, you know, one of those things that uh, allow you to, to shuffle cards like in a casino. <laughs> and so in that case, I cannot, sh I, I cannot uh, sleeve them because they won't fit into the machine. And so <laughs> it's so fun to use it that I'm not going to, to sleeve cards <laughs> as I want to use the machine. <laughs> yeah, that's a good tip. Get a card shuffler. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right, let's move into our third question. Let's see what comes out there. It'd be interesting to see if other people have that obsession of sleeving all the cards. Uh, oh, a lot of people do. A lot of people do, yeah. And it's very costly as well. So I think I'll, get, I'll rather spend my money on board games. Now, another agree or disagree question here. So now, 
Puzzles are puzzles, i.e. jigsaws and physical escape boxes, for example, okay? They are not board games. Would you agree or disagree? <laughs> I agree. Uh, if there, there's a there's a caveat though, I mean, if the whole game is a puzzle, uh, then yes, I consider it a puzzle rather than a game. If it's a board game that has elements of a puzzle, then it's a different thing. But yeah, not a bit, but that's boils down to to personal taste. I'm not a fan of of you know uh, detective puzzles and stuff like that. I totally see the 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 fascination, the interest, but it's not my cup of tea. I, I, it's not the type of game I I uh, tend to play. So uh, yeah, I think in general I regard them as being not really board games. <laughs> I can I can drop here uh, a controversial point. Uh, to me, some heavy German games, uh, German design style of games. I mean, the, the stereotypical way of calling them like designers games. Uh, some of them are almost a puzzle to me because it's all about finding the perfect engine uh, to 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 win the game and. I'm not getting much fun out of those types of games. Uh, again, uh, yes, they're board games, but <laughs> they're borderline puzzles because it's really all about figuring out the mechanics. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I feel the same way because when I'm playing, I'll give a, a good example. I love cats, okay? Now, it is a board game, very puzzly as well. So to me, I was still putting the category, it's a board game, but it's very puzzly. That was a type of board game. Whereas a jigsaw is a jigsaw. It's not a board game, it's a jigsaw. An escape room game is an escape room game. So as it's its own category, which I agree with. Yes. The, where it comes into a grey area, so Detective Charlie, which is a kid's kind of social deduction game, um, kind of puzzle, you're going to figure out who the culprit is based on the information that's on the cards that are presented. That is borderline a board game slash kind of puzzle type of game. I would still categorize it as a board game, um, but it's on that border gray line where you could argue yes. it's just done a puzzle escapement type of game where you're solving these puzzles to find out who did it. It's on the very similar lines to that type of game. So there are some caveats, like you say, and some arguments, but I think it's I think everyone would agree a puzzle's a puzzle. <laughs> and it should still remain that that is yes. a, and uh, kind of little jigsaw is a jigsaw. Regardless of what kind of different elements are involved, is a jigsaw. Um, so it's important to kind of dif differentiate that, which makes it much easier when you're marketing and selling and how you're going to sell it. But yeah, there are some arguments to say that certain things would feature as a board game, certain things would feature as a puzzle type. So it'll be interesting to see what viewers think as well, because you could argue all day and long, what yes. The, what the end of the day, as long as you enjoy it, that's all that matters. Absolutely, and that's when categories come in handy. Uh, knowing clearly before you you buy a game, before you try a game, what the game is about is, is a good thing. So if I know that it's going to be a so it's social deduction type of game, a mystery game, and so on, I know already the type of game it is, so I can be in or out depending on personal taste. Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's move in to our fourth question. <clears throat> Rumble, let's see if we've got a different type this time. <laughs> we have another agree or disagree. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> right. oh, this is an interesting one. So do you agree or disagree with this phrase? The majority of expansions improve a board game. Um, I disagree. I disagree because, well, historically, based on the games I designed, uh, like War of the Ring, War of the Ring, for example, or also the newest one, Dune, uh, they are both complete game in the core set. They don't need anything else. And uh, we do expansions for games like that uh, for people who are 150% in the game. So much that they play the game uh, so many times that eventually they will need uh, an additional 
uh, incentive to keep playing or or they just have the curiosity to to try different things but uh i i think that an expansion is exactly an expansion so it's more of the same or uh it's just more um new options and stuff like that they don't need they don't have to necessarily improve the game because if they do it means that the core game wasn't good enough <laughs> it needed to be improved so in that case if i was a designer that makes an expansion to a game that makes the game better i would look into making a second edition of the game including the expansion because that is showing a weakness in the core game so in, in so in my mind expansions are not necessarily improvements are just expansions so more yeah it's a good way to see it, it enhances the playing experience not necessarily improves the experience uh, and that's yeah. a good point there are some exceptions where like you say some board games have needed an expansion to fix a problem yeah. uh, and then you could argue well why was that picked up during play test <laughs> um yeah. it happens yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I don't even name in those games, but there are some exceptions where there's been questions, why was this released without proper playtesting and they've had to bring out a fix because there's been an issue with it or an imbalance, for example. And even well-known game designers have brought out expansions, for example, different um, cards or player cards to balance the imbalances and the power abilities that have perhaps come out on the you know the original release of the game and have needed a bit of an expansion to fix that problem. So there are some ex exceptions, but I think I agree the majority is just to enhance the experience, not to say a fix a problem. Yeah, in an ideal world, they should be like that. Uh, but as you say, it happens that a game uh, is released and eventually you find out that there are problems with it. Uh, what I think most uh, games enthusiasts know very well when you release a game, uh, even if you play tested it uh, a long time, for a long time, uh, when the game is released, it's going to be played way more than it was play tested because we were talking about uh, thousands of people playing the game with friends. So um, even if you played hundreds of times a game, there is still the possibility that there is a freak. Uh, occurrence in the game, if, uh, or or something you didn't see uh, that that uh, crops up, and then you have to to address it. And in that case, an expansion can do it. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> game designers cannot be. I mean, now it's 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 better than in the past because uh, with tabletop simulators and stuff like that, you can play a lot more. You can play test the game a lot more than in the past. Uh, I remember that when we released uh, War of the Ring in 2004, our playtesters were heroes because they had to, to create uh, the game uh, physically and the game had lots of components. So they were cutting and pasting and, and pasting and using cards and, and they played hundreds of games, hundreds. Uh, we had a very, very total playtest uh, phase. And now it's so much easier, so much easier. So... And in any case, we were lucky at the time because uh, we didn't have any any big imbalance problems with World Ring, even in, in its first incarnation. We had to just make just a little tweak uh, from first edition to second. I have to say, I still prefer the old old fashioned way of physically playing the game rather than digitally. And everyone's different. Yes. Everyone's different. I, it's a different feel. I think if you're yes. physically. And you can, I, I actually think you iron out more bugs in a game design physically playing it rather than online digitally. Oh, well, there are certain dynamics that you can't see uh, with a digital version of the game. Dynamics that are like, for example, uh, lag, uh, meaning, I mean, downtime between turns. Uh, normally, digital games are faster because the, the, the simulator can do things that you can eventually have to do manually. And there is also banter between the players. So maybe the fun element can be lower playing digitally, but the strategic element can be higher because you play more quickly and, and it's some things are more apparent. So yeah, you, you probably have to do both. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's move in to our fifth question. Let's see if we get a different one because we've had a lot of the uh, we disagree. Uh, happens sometimes. And well, <laughs> a yes or a no question okay. so that's 
a filler. So, are board game storage inserts necessary? No. Why, why they're not? convenient, but they're not. I mean, <laughs> there's also the additional thing that sometimes, I mean, I appreciate the fact that there are companies doing inserts for games. On, on one side, you can see that as a sort of a gray market because there is, for example, again, for War of the Rings, it's a, it's a game that has been out for 18 years now. There is lots of inserts that are done by companies and a lot of custom components made by people on Etsy, for example. So there is a huge gray market of stuff that uh, creates money for, for, for people that is not the designers or the publishing company. <laughs> but then again, I'm, I'm joking. I'm totally fine with that because, of course, it's an expression of the success of a game and also eventually brings more interest to the game anyway because of course people maybe they can buy a game because they know they have some very nice components on etsy to buy from from creators so but again going back to the question i don't think they're necessary i'm i'm a fairly uh, precise guy as games are concerned so i can store my games well even without uh, I, well, I was actually answering to custom inserts. Was the question about custom inserts or the... Just in inserts in general, so it could be both. Okay, well, uh, if a game is produced well, uh, what you have in the box is already very good, uh, is, is already functioning very well. I mean, if you have the chance to see it, there's the, the, uh, the exclusive version of Dune uh, done for Kickstarter that is now being received, well, is, uh, is getting to backers, is, has plastic inserts for the miniatures that are a masterpiece. <laughs> They're done so well. So, yeah. Uh, in, in the case of games with huge components like that, if you lose those inserts, you're, you're, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> I think the, there are some exceptions. So I'll give an mm. example. Crusaders, okay, classic example. With the expansion, you need an insert because the, the lid just doesn't close. Yeah. But you need the expansion, which you can, like you say, you can get an Etsy custom made expansion to get, uh, so the insert to get the expansion and the base game all into the box nice and snug. I've tried to get it in nice and snug without the insert, and it's impossible. So there are some, ex <laughs> there are some exceptions. But I think for, for a game, and a, um, Snow Tales, for example, doesn't have an insert, doesn't need an insert. It's a big box uh, because it's some big board pieces that you'll be connecting to create the racetrack. It does not need an insert. So there's a majority of games, like you say, don't need an insert. It's unnecessary. And it's almost like a luxury component that you, you're having for convenience. Yeah. And I think uh, it's about whether that's cost effective or not. And for a lot of people, they can't afford it because some are extortionally expensive. So it's whether, is it essential? If it's not essential, do you really need it? And I think that's a question people should ask themselves. Yeah, no, you don't. You don't need them. I mean, it's it depends on the level of, of your passion into the games. Because if you're a casual gamer, if you start to be a hobby uh, gamer, then it's like everything else. It's like collecting stamps or whatever. You, you're going to buy additional stuff just because it, it is convenient. It, it makes your, your hobby, hobby, hobby more, uh, more fun to, 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 for you. So yeah, I think it's, they're not necessary though. The, 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 they shouldn't be, uh, so. I, I completely agree. Only if it's essential, you would need one. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move into our question six. I think we've been six. Yes, we are. So mm -hmm. let's see if we get a different type. So question six is, once I open it, there we go. It's a yes or a no. So will we see more board game companies fold in this year, so 2024. So will we see more going to administration and collapse uh, this year? Whether we will see more companies fold or not? Yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, as far as I can tell, uh, the, the year is not off to a good start. 
uh, for companies. I mean, we've seen big companies like Hasbro laying off a lot of people before Christmas and stuff like that. So th th that's not a good sign. Uh, we have to consider also that we are in a probably in a moment where we coming out of the pandemic. The pandemic was paradoxically very good for for board gaming companies. Uh, there was necessarily a moment where we would have seen sales go down. Uh, but of course, also now the international situation and prices for freight got going up. Yes, we will see problems. But uh, I think that healthy companies will cope with it, will be able to, to take measures and avoid folding. Uh, if a company is going to close down, it's going to be the indication of a larger problem uh, with the company already existing and, and eventually something that they could probably have fixed if things were going up, but they're not. So there might be some uh, a number of companies, but I, uh, I don't have the, 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 the pulse of that. So I don't have any personal information on, on companies in dire straits economically. So hopefully not. <laughs> I think we will see smaller, especially independent publishers fall this year. I think there will be a lot because like this, what people don't realize sometimes when you've had a recession and what generally happens is you have a bit of a gap where people think it's all fine. And all of a sudden, usually what happens is there's a huge dip before it levels out properly for a long period of time, usually for another five to 10 yeah. years, have another one. That's usually what happens. So it's the kind of back end. It's like the after effects of a tornado, for example. You don't realize all the damage is done until months after, until you've reevaluated it all. And I think this year we will see smaller independent publishers fold or be taken on by the larger uh, publishers. I asked me, Dave, for example, have taken on quite a lot. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And I think we'll start to see them kind of amalgamate some into kind of just a few. Um, it, you know, uh, the kind of larger portfolio of companies um, just to kind of get the, their stock uh, bumped up into a few areas. I think that's what will happen. Um, we'll start seeing some realigning with some of the larger uh, companies. Um, for example, Hasbro will be concentrating on the gaming sections and board gaming toy sections. That's what they're going to concentrate on and close the rest of the businesses down. Uh, they can consolidate that as part of that administration process. So I think we'll see a lot more of that happening. And I think we'll see, see more news of the smaller and independent publishers fold. I think that's inevitable. It will happen. It's unfortunate and it's sad, but unfortunately that's the, the way life is sometimes and it's about how do we adapt as an industry and, and try and try and stay strong and it is as a concern because i think what's going to happen is we're going to start seeing a bigger gap between these larger companies and these kind mm. of that's ones. possible yes mm. um, mm. and that's what happens it happens in all industries um it can be good and it can be bad as well so i think we'll see that well time will tell but that's my prediction of what's what will happen this year so we will see Yes. <laughs> so let's move in to our seventh question or phrase, depending on what it is. So our next one is what phrase comes to mind? So when someone pushes in front of you, waiting in line at a convention to get one of the last few copies of a board game. <laughs> what phrase comes to mind? I want to say what well, first thing that comes to mind. I must be honest. The first thing that I thought was, "Well, I'm glad I'm not that desperate <laughs> to get something." I think I'd have a stronger phrase. To be honest, and it's uh, <laughs> on, on here. But <laughs> I would be too happy. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be happy. But I think that the first thing I would think, "Okay, well, cool now, man." <laughs> it's a game. <laughs> yeah. I, I do see it. When I watch these videos on, at conventions, you see people can rummage. The majority of people are polite. Okay? I want to be clear with that. Uh, but there are a, a handful that kind of abuse that and try and get in in front of others, especially when they're trying to get first front into the door. It's just mayhem. It's absolutely crazy. And I sit there thinking, 
like 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 you just said, it's only a, it's only a board game. <laughs> it's not going out in existing. Yeah. And and I will say, I have to be honest, I I'm. Uh, quite privileged by being uh, a professional in the game industry because I generally don't have to cope with that sort of, of problems. I mean, for example, there's uh, the biggest convention I, I normally go to is the Luca Comics and Games version in, uh, convention in Italy. That incredibly, it's incredible, but there is more people coming to that convention than in uh, uh, San Diego Comic Con in the States. So it's a huge, huge convention. And I can say that I would probably stop going there if it wasn't because I'm going there as a professional and, and I don't have to stand in any line because I'm going to my booth and so on. Uh, otherwise, it, it, sometimes I think, I mean, it's it's good that we have so much passionate uh, players because I wouldn't stand for hours in a line to, to get to see something. And they do. <laughs> and so, yeah. so, yeah, I'm not... Generally, um, it doesn't happen often to have that problem to 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 be pushed in a line and so on, just because I'm going there with a company and so on. But in any case, yes, I'm happy. I'm I'm not that desperate to get something <laughs> so much to push in front of people. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same fence where I don't need to go to a convention. I don't care where I'm the first that's got the game. I really don't care. Um, I can just shop online at my convenience or whatever it's, it's, it's uh, yeah. based on all that money to get to a convention. I understand the appeal to conventions is a completely different topic of conversation, um, which we covered in previous se- uh, series. But yeah, that, that, I can understand why people love to get there first, why they love the buzz and the vibe of a convention and to meet people perhaps I haven't seen for a long time because people come from all over the world to go to conventions. Right. There's lots of positives to it. But being crammed in a room full of lots of sweaty people it does not appeal to me and, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's one of those strange things i'd rather go to like you say a small convention where it's more of a gaming oh, session you know and i can interact. well as a game designer as a game designer there is a big positive part of going to conventions is that since you don't normally work um on your own uh, without seeing much of the effect that your creations have on the public, it's really good to go to a convention and see people playing your games. And, and that's that's very much that energy that you need to continue doing what you do because sometimes you, you, you are racked by doubts. And um, are people really buying the game because they like it or because it's Lord of the Rings or because it's Dune? And then when you see people playing the game, you can actually see the reason why they're playing it. It's not it's not just because there's a brand on the cover or, or or anything, because you can see they're actually enjoying what you create. And so yeah, conventions are necessary to game designers from that point of view. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move in to our next question. We want question number eight. So, question number eight, it's a yes or a no. Do board game tables enhance the gaming experience? No, I would say no. Um, to expand on that, I think that every as every luxury item, they're nice. Uh, I have a very nice studio right now where I work with Marco and... Uh, we have some very large tables, but they are not gaming tables in the sense of custom-made tables with lights and stuff like that. Or so they're just wide. They're just wide enough to 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 enable any type of game to be played on them. Uh, so yeah, it's better than having a small kitchen table. Uh, but otherwise, if you have enough space, you don't you don't need. Uh, a custom made table but yeah it's one of those things you can uh, treat yourself to if you if you have the money for it, for it it's if if gaming is a passion and it's like having a nice tv set or anything that is more than the basics <laughs> it's I, I, good yeah i completely agree so i've, I've got a standard table I don't have a board gaming table and i've got a nice solid wood large table which is more than enough i don't be fucking at another 1500 pound just for the convenience of <laughs> yes. it off it just doesn't make sense 
Whereas when I go to my board gaming group on a Friday, they've got an actual proper board gaming table. And it is nice. It's, it feels more of a luxury experience, but it's not a necessity. And like you say, if you've no. got the money, then fine. And that's, that's your main hobby and your interest, then great, go and get it. But if it's not, is it really necessary to be spending that much money because they're expensive? Or would you rather keep the money and spend it on board games or other items? So it's yeah, about... Definitely. So let's move in to our number eight question. Let's see what comes out. I think we're in number eight. Are we number nine, sorry? Mm -hmm. I hope I did my mathematics correctly. So question nine, yes or no? Should board game companies and retailers offer a service to apply board game shield? Do you know what board game shield is? Where they've got that, that liquid that protects the board games from any spells and damage that gets put onto them. Oh no, I didn't know that. Can you can you explain it again? What it is? Uh, a product called Board Game Shield, uh, Board Game Guard, or Board Game Shield, uh, which you can, you can get online uh, around the world. And what it is, you apply a small bit of liquid, and then you apply it onto the board, and okay. that will protect it. So when you, for example, you have to spill wine on it. What it will do is it'll do, it's like a, a protective cover. It'll just slide off and protect you. Okay. No, it's similar to some products they do for for puzzles, I guess. But uh, I don't know. I didn't even know it existed. And I mean, I of course get really mad if somebody spills wine or anything on my boards <laughs> where we play games, and I'm very nervous when I see people eating and and drinking around the table when we play. Uh, so I understand the the, the, the the need, but I wouldn't go to the point of thinking that games publishers or shops should provide for that. It's it, we're really we're really at the at the border of of uh, I don't know providing gloves for you to play the games. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you know we have sometimes a similar thing where we play test games but because we print the boards on paper and so i put a, a big plexiglass um how do you say plate uh plexiglass uh, yeah pane on on the table just to to make the board flat and to avoid being uh ruined by by carelessness but but yeah i don't think i would i would go with the liquid on the boards to, to protect them. I, I generally hope that companies will produce uh, boards that are good enough to, to withstand normal damage. So some spills, some stuff that fall on them, and they're not going to get ruined by, by um, the occasional drop from coffee or wine. Yeah, I've seen uh, boards where you can get that uh, protective sheet cover that they can put on, which is a very thin layer of sheet, which uh, does provide some protection, not completely, but some protection. And that's that's all it needs, and it's very cheap to apply that. Uh, it's yeah. whether companies want to do that or not as part of the manufacturing process, because it is another step in the process plan. So, yeah, it'd be interested to see what other people or viewers think as well, whether they, they do that. And I can understand for games that are out of print, very rare. I completely understand that. But yeah, for all board games, that, that and the, and all on the stage, just ask people not to perhaps put the drink so close to the board, uh, and you'll be fine. Yes, <laughs> yes. But appropriate etiquetteness when you're you're playing a board game. Be civil, <laughs> civil about it. <laughs> <laughs> but then to our final question, Francesco, and we have got what phrase comes to mind. So what phrase comes to mind when you receive a new game with broken miniatures? Oh. Uh, I immediately think of the pain I will have to go through to get to, to get a replacement. Yeah, that's then I will have to post this and get the replacement from the company. <laughs> Inconvenience. Yes. It, it is convenience. Generally, companies are pretty good at replacing PCs because yeah. they generally need more copies of games for obvious reasons for, for for replacement parts. And I've found, you know, relatively all all the companies have been great at replacing any items. Um, so generally, it's not an issue; it's just an inconvenience, isn't it? 
to, yeah. you know, they're also stuff. getting better, getting better in packaging the stuff. Uh, the back to the to the to the inserts that we were talking about before. Now the the, the inserts that company usually put into games with a lot of miniatures are good enough to prevent uh, breaking uh, of any pieces. What what may happen still more than having a piece that is broken is to have a misplaced uh, piece, like two of the same instead of two different ones. So that that is something that I heard happening sometimes. You get two different figures, two figures of the same type instead of two different ones because they were too close. I can, I sometimes think of the pains that, that people that work in, in uh, putting together the product in factories, how, they must be mad at us as game designers and players thinking when, when they look at a game with hundreds of miniatures and, and slightly different ones and they must think who are the freaks that are going to play this they need so many different slightly different things <laughs> by the hundreds and they have to be there and pick them and, and quality check them <laughs> but in the end it's uh i i think it's a the, this Occasional hiccups in production is what we, it's the price we pay for games that are so much better than the games we used to play decades ago. I mean, the, the production, the quality of the productions today is incredible, incredible. The, the number of pieces you get for, yeah, games are costly, but they are not that costly. I mean, the majority of games that we get today from ordinary productions are the equivalent of luxury items of decades ago. Uh, I remember games that we considered to be luxurious, like the Avalon Hill board games of the past. They were considered to be luxurious just because they had hard mounted boards on cardboard instead of <laughs> flimsy paper. That was something that we said, oh yeah, that's a good company compared to SPI, for example, because SPI had all the paper maps. I'm talking about board, uh, war games. And that was considered luxury item. And today we have hundreds of sculpted miniatures in, in the game, in different colors and so on. So we're in a golden age as far as uh, yeah. board game components and production is concerned. Yeah, unless you pass pro and keep bringing out cheap tacky items. And there are some exceptions. but uh, Yeah, hopefully. yeah, there are. There are, yes. <laughs> watching this or if they are hopefully they can increase the production quality because it's shocking um but there we go that's what happens when you go into administration to cut costs so that brings us to, to the end of this so i would just like to thank our guest francesco for uh, participating i hope that was enjoyable and i hope it gives you at home some insight as well and please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so and we will be bringing out more out of the series and this will be our final series of under the meeple light show and we've got some great guests ones that are coming back from season one as well it'll be interesting to see how they tackle our new set of questions so i'd like to thank everyone for watching and please do give this video a like if you enjoyed it and let us know in the comments down below please let us know your thoughts on some of these questions as well. But until the next time, take care and keep on playing lots of board games.